Well, as I was thinking about celebrating the 60th anniversary of the life of this church and the history of God working uh, in Taze Valley, I was reminded of, of Nehemiah and of his rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. And this is such a wonderful study. At some time in the future, we'll probably work our way uh, through this book. It's, it's a great example of, of leadership, of a godly servant, and, and the leadership abilities and skills um, that he used to accomplish the impossible. Uh, just going to briefly summarize a little bit of, of Nehemiah uh, this morning. But Nehemiah had it made. He lived in the king's palace. He ate the best food in the kingdom. He held a trusted position. He was a cupbearer to the king. Do you know what a cupbearer is? It was somebody, you know, kings were always threatened just like leaders are today and they have special uh, protection details. Well, one of the ways you could get rid of a of a king or someone in leadership was to poison their food. So a cupbearer to the king was somebody who was a very trusted person, but they would sample all the food. They would drink the wine uh, before the king would drink it. If the guy lived, hey, the, it's not poisoned, and so the king would drink it. So it was kind of a dangerous position, but it was also a very trusted position. And so Nehemiah could have continued his life on easy street, but he didn't. He received, you see, Nehemiah was living in exile. This wasn't his home. He was living in a foreign land. He was serving um, God. He was serving this king away from his home, away from his relatives, his family, the others and who have been exiled. And they had returned to Jerusalem. And he was curious, and an opportunity came for him to get some information about how things were going in Jerusalem. But the word he got was not a good word. You know, the, the walls have crumbled down. They lie in ruins. And the walls in Jerusalem, that's how you protected yourself from the enemy. You had these walls of protection. And so there was no protection from the enemies. And when he heard this, he was deeply grieved, deeply burdened. And he spent days weeping and fasting and praying before the Lord. And as he was doing that, he gathered a vision. He analyzed the situation. He took inventory and he went to Jerusalem kind of secretly by himself. And he went and he took a tour of the walls. And he evaluated what was going on. And he developed a plan. He found support for the plan. The king noticed one day that, that Nehemiah was, was really upset. He couldn't hide it. He couldn't keep it uh, stuffed down any longer. And the king, this shows the intimate relationship that he had. And the king said, hey, what's going on, Nehemiah? You're, you're upset. I've never seen you like this before. And Nehemiah took this opportunity to share his burden with the king. And he asked the king, can you help us in this situation? And the king uh, helped, helped Nehemiah, um, and he provided some, some letters of, of permission as he traveled and for so, support. And so Nehemiah had a plan. He took his plan to the people, and he communicated to, to everyone in Jerusalem. And in that plan, he involved everybody in the rebuilding of the wall. And he placed people where their gifts uh, were. But then he asked them to rebuild the wall where their family lived. And if you're going to be rebuilding the wall that's in protecting your family, your home, you're going to put your very, very best work in it, aren't you? So he used a lot of wisdom and a lot of skill. But even in the midst of this great project that he was undertaking, he found immediate opposition. There were those who, 
who mocked him, those who challenged him, those who, who said you can't do it, the naysayers. And throughout the, the project, he found opposition. But also through it all, we see that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. And he prayed to God every step of the way to the rebuilding of the wall. And the result was a miraculous rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem in 52 days. Truly, it was a miracle. I think Nehemiah can teach us a lot as we stand here today and we think about the, the celebrate the 60th anniversary of Taze Valley Presbyterian Church. Today is a time of reflection, a time of soul searching, a time of remembering of what God has done through us through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's also a time of looking forward to what God wants us to do in the future. Stefan Serfin, the guy videoing back there, um, doesn't want any attention, but he created a beautiful history. He's done a, a wonderful work on the, um, on the history, the 60-year history of our church. And it's being put together at the, at the printers uh, into a, a book form, and we'll find out more information that you can purchase um, at, a, at a later date. But he put together a wonderful history of, of how the church was, was founded, how it was um, put together, the vision that God gave um, Dr. Walter White and, and a few other people. And I was excited to see how God used these men and and it was exciting because I knew some of these people uh, as, a, as a young child. And, and I knew some of these people. And, and uh, it was exciting to see how these people worked to make this church turn from a vision into a reality. And I believe that we are entering a new day today in the life of Taze Valley Presbyterian Church. Today, as we reflect on the ebb and the flow of ministry over the past 60 years, there have been some successes and there have been some struggles. There have been some wonderful blessings as the building was accomplished. And yet there are some cracks in the walls. There are places where, where ministry has crumbled. Places that need to be patched. And places that might need to be completely rebuilt and even better and, and more efficient ways to reflect the changes in our society over these past 60 years. We have faced some trials and some tribulations in our past that's brought us where we are today. A time of renewal and a time of rebuilding. As we look to next year, 2020, 2020, we need to focus with 2020 vision on the future. And we need to keep our eyes fixed and focused on Jesus Christ and his call on us to make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them the things that Jesus taught his disciples were to pass that heritage on down, heritage that we have for 2,000 years. We are to continue doing that as we move into the future, teaching others to obey Jesus Christ. I also know that whenever there is a renewed commitment to the Lord, there will also be increased opposition by Satan. And walls are built for protection. And that's why Nehemiah was so concerned when he learned that the walls of his people were in ruin. He knew that he had to do something about it. And he committed his life to rebuilding that wall no matter what the cost. He gave up, gave up life on easy street in order to take a risk to, to build this wall. 
Let's take a, his, a trip back uh, into the history of Nehemiah and see what we can glean from him. In Nehemiah 2, 17, Nehemiah pointed out their condition. The people heard his plea. They reorganized themselves and they agreed together that they would start rebuilding that wall. And that is where we are today. Now is the time. Now is the season to rebuild our relationship with God. Now is the time to rebuild our relationship with the community around us. To rebuild the relationship in our families and with our church family. Nehemiah, despite fierce opposition, completed rebuilding the wall in 52 days. Nehemiah took a desperately impossible situation and through compassion, prayer, vision, preparation, perseverance, and communication, Nehemiah was used by God to achieve the impossible. And they rebuilt a wall of rubble in 52 days. Sometimes as I look at the problems around us, I feel like David going up against the giant Goliath. We are so little and the problems loom so large. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Trust God. Find his will and his way. And in faith, keep our eyes, our 2020 vision focused on him and not on the problems around us. All David needed was his faith in God and a little slingshot. And he slayed the giant. David refused to be taunted by the, by the threats of the giant. He knew that his God was bigger than any obstacle, and so did Nehemiah. As I observe the chaotic conditions of the world around us, I'm convicted and I'm convinced that there are walls of love that need to be rebuilt. There are walls of trust that need to be rebuilt. There are walls of hope that need to be rebuilt. There are walls of faith that need to be rebuilt. There are walls of truth that need to be rebuilt. There are walls of loyalty that need to be rebuilt. And we must work together to get the job done. We must work together to bring back wayward children home. We must work together to get those who have drifted away from the faith to return to Jesus. We must work together to get those 68% of believers, according to the U.S. Census survey, who say they are not involved in, in church And Scott Depot, 68% of the people responded on that census that they aren't involved in a church. We need to reach out to those people and get those people to confess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. We must work together to tell the world about Jesus. But how can we do all this? It seems impossible. We are so small and the problems loom so large. Without God, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible to those who believe. Do you believe? It's been said that the beginning of the longest journey begins with the first step. Recognizing the problem 
and deciding to do something about it. But just deciding to do something about something is not enough. How many times have you decided to do something but never followed through with it? Oh, I'm so guilty of that. But notice what Nehemiah did. He discovered the problem. The wall around Jerusalem was in ruins. He carefully evaluated the situation. He counted the cost. He made a plan. He obtained support for his plan. And he got people invested and committed to the plan. And the next step began. There was opposition. And we can expect immediate opposition. It's not unusual. Jesus' entire ministry was met with opposition. All he came to do was to do good and to fulfill all the Old Testament promises of God. And he was met from the very beginning with opposition. King Herod tried to kill him and he killed uh, little babies under two years old all around trying to wipe out this promised new king. At his baptism, people resisted him, but God affirmed him. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And then immediately after this affirmation of God, he was sent out into the wilderness to be tested and tempted by Satan. And the Holy Spirit was the one that drove him out there. This was all a part of God's plan. Forty days and forty nights he fasted. Satan came to him at his weakest moments and tempted him with the areas that he was most uh, needy and starving in. And he resisted Satan with the word of God, the power of God. And Jesus said, man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so that opposition continued throughout Jesus' life until ultimately the people that he came to save, crucified him on a cross. David was called by God to be king. He said, you're going to be a king. But there was another king who stood in the way. That was King Saul. And King Saul tried to kill David. And then there was another Saul, Saul who became Paul in the New Testament. And he was, a, he was a, 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 a persecutor of, of Christians, of this new belief. And he tried to wipe them out. But he had a close encounter with the king of kings. And it knocked him off the horse. It struck him blind. And it changed his life. And so one who was a persecutor of Christians became one of the greatest defender of Christians. But in the beginning, the people didn't trust him. Oh, no, I don't know about that guy. I'm not going to trust him. And Paul himself, a faithful servant of God who lived his life devoted to God, found himself constantly being persecuted for being obedient to God. Then there was Noah. Noah was called by God to build an ark. What's an ark, Lord? It's going to be a flood. What's a flood, Lord? God called Noah to build an ark in the middle of the desert. Can you imagine the mocking, the abuse that he and his families took? But Noah stood. He built that ark. Just as God told him how to do it. And they mocked him up to the point that the rains began to fall. And it was too late by then. Then Pentecost, the birthday of the church. We celebrate our anniversary, but uh, the birthday of our church goes all the way back 2,000 years. When God poured out his Holy Spirit among his people. And on that very birthday, that very beginning of the church. There was resistance. Some doubted. They said, they're just drunk. 
And they ignore, ignored a miracle that was taking place right in front of them. Jesus had many hard sayings that he said. And there were people who wanted to follow him when he fed them fish sandwiches. Yeah, they loved him. They gathered around him. But when he challenged them with harder things, many turned away. And at the end, there was almost nobody there for Jesus. So we can expect opposition and doubt to follow as we make commitments to our Lord Jesus Christ. Expect expect trials in your family when you walk with God. I don't know about you, but when I but I face opposition whenever I make serious commitments to God. If you haven't already, you will. If you're serious about your commitments, because Satan doesn't like it when we fight against him. That's why we need reminders of the covenants and the commitments that we have made. God is constantly telling us throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. Testament to remember what he has done. Noah in Genesis, God made a covenant with Noah and his descendants, including us in all of creation. He made a covenant. He made a promise that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. And as a sign of that promise, he made a rainbow, a beautiful, glorious rainbow in the sky. So that when we see that rainbow, we can remember his promise. The world will never again be destroyed by a flood. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. As he was establishing this new people, this called out group of slaves, of people who were nobody, God was forming them into a somebody, his chosen people. And he gave, them, gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And yet there was resistance. Moses came down, the, down from the mountain. He saw the people had already turned against God and were worshiping a calf made from their own hands of, of gold. It's sad today that we live in a society with, with these God-given instructions of how to live your life. But they've all been removed from the public square and they're confined to those religious people in church, in their churches on Sunday. In Joshua 24, Joshua made a covenant with God that we will serve the Lord. And at Shechem, Joshua used a large stone as a covenant reminder of his promise there. David had visions of building a magnificent temple to hold God. They've been traveling around through history in, in the tabernacle and, and David looked at his palace and he said, wow, I'm living in splendor here. We ought to have a place for God to dwell. And I want to build that temple. But God said, no, David's a great thought, great idea, but you're not going to build it. You have blood on your hands. You're a warrior. You've been a warrior. Your son is going to build the temple. David could have easily gotten discouraged and gotten upset and said, but, you know, I did what you told me to do, Lord. But no, David committed millions of his own dollars and efforts into preparing and providing and building that temple that his son Solomon uh, would finally build. And the Ark of the Covenant reminded that God's presence was with his people wherever they went. A new covenant was given in the New Testament. The word testament means covenant. A new covenant was given through Jesus Christ. And the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper that we're going to celebrate in a few minutes are visual reminders of God's invisible grace. They remind us of God's love and the sacrificial work of his son Jesus Christ on the, on the cross and the power of the resurrection. 
Back in the Old Testament and still today for a Jewish people, the Shema, we've talked about that several times, and the Shema means hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is, is one, and you're to tell it to your children at all times of the, when you walk with your kids, when you take them to the park, when you, when you place them down to, uh, to bed at night, when you feed them around the table, all these times you're to teach these lessons to your children. So that they will know and remember who God is. The covenants are contracts which God has made with us and commitments that we make to him to be followers of Jesus Christ. And to daily pick up our crosses and follow Jesus no matter what the cost. Sometimes we need to write those commitments down and to tell others about them. So that we can refer to them later and be encouraged by others when the going gets rough. Satan will try to tell you, uh, get you to think that it wasn't real. That commitment you made wasn't really real. It didn't mean anything. He will put you to the test. And when he does, focus on God. Cling to your covenant and don't look back to the way things were. Like Lot's wife did when God was judging um, that place. And she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. My hope is the example of Nehemiah can inspire us to be faithful in our ministry. Nehemiah experienced desperation, opposition, weariness, loneliness, and disappointment. Yes, yet he also experienced God's best. Here's how he expressed it. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. So let us look forward. We are rebuilding the wall of God's church. Today we celebrate our history. But tomorrow, don't look back. Focus on Christ. It's his church that we are building, not ours. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And we are his ambassadors called to communicate his message of love and forgiveness to the world. We are Christ's servants. Literally, his slaves Call to obedience and service to train and equip others also to be followers of Jesus. In Nehemiah 3, we see that everyone was involved in the rebuilding of the wall. Everyone had a place, a task, and a job to do. It wasn't Nehemiah that was building the wall. He worked on the wall too, but his primary job was to pray, seek God's vision, his plan, and to make sure that they were doing it and to keep God's vision among the people, before the people. God has gifted each and every one of you. He has has a plan for you and for the building and rebuilding of his church. It's something that is bigger than any one of us to do. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ and his church. And that must always be our focus. Not what I want. Not what we want. But what does Jesus want? It's all about Jesus. It's not about self. It's about community. God said in the beginning of his creation, it's not good for man to be alone. We are the family of God, called to be together by him. And we must think and act like it. The wonderful example in the in Acts of the early church where they fellowship together. They love to worship with God, worship God, gather together, hear the preaching, celebrate the sacraments, break bread, eat things together in their homes, pray together. But they delighted in doing this. 
And it's a beautiful picture and model of what the church is still called to be and to do today. Communion is remembering what it's all about. It's about being empowered by the Spirit of God. We're not perfect, but He is perfect. As we remember what God has done for us in the past 60 year uh, history of the Taze Valley Presbyterian Church, let us once again commit ourselves to be His disciples, His followers. May God's Spirit transform us more and more each day into His image and His likeness. And we, may we show the love, the acceptance, and the forgiveness which we have also received from Him. May we show that to others. Let us begin the next 60 years of ministry focused on God and what He has done for us through Jesus Christ. And let us seek how he wants us to respond to that love. Let us now prepare our hearts to receive this sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And let us silently enter into a time of prayer. Let us pray.